Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is still true and directly related to our lives today. If you'd like to learn more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button below. We hope you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Only prostitutes and vain people wear makeup and jewelry. If you wear them, you're a sinner. Have you ever heard someone say something like this? Or maybe you've been made to feel guilty for wearing rings, earrings, makeup, or necklaces. If so, you're not alone. In our blog on our website, you will find a short post titled Modesty and Lust, Who's Responsible? There has been a big push in some Christian circles against women wearing makeup and jewelry. Today, we want to take a look at that subject to find out what Scripture says about it. But we're going to examine it using the whole of Scripture and not just a few verses. So then, what do the Scriptures have to say about these topics? Are jewelry and makeup really forbidden by Yahweh? Why some say jewelry should not be worn. There are many reasons people argue that the Bible prohibits jewelry and makeup. We'll be reviewing five of the more common ones and Scriptures some use to argue those points. Number one, pagans wore jewelry and makeup. The claims relating to pagans wearing jewelry and makeup often go something like this. We know the pagans wore jewelry. We know the pagans wore makeup. We know that God says not to do what the pagans do. Therefore, we should not wear jewelry or makeup. That's some pretty sound logic, right? Two premises followed by a conclusion. Unfortunately, what this type of statement does is it removes the context of what Yahweh commanded. Let's take a look at the verses where those who object to jewelry and makeup may be pulling this from. Deuteronomy 12.4 You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. Deuteronomy 12.31 You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. For every abominable thing Yahweh hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. And finally, Jeremiah 10, which has perhaps their strongest support. Jeremiah 10.2 Thus says Yahweh, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. It's pretty easy to explain why the verses in Deuteronomy have nothing to do with jewelry. These verses are saying that we should not worship Yahweh the same way that the Canaanites worship their gods. This is referring to things like making idols, engaging in cult prostitution, and sacrificing children, not to everyday, ordinary things like wearing jewelry. So that leaves us with Jeremiah 10, which seems pretty straightforward. If the nations are wearing jewelry, then we should not. However, when we continue reading the same passage, we see this is again relating to worshiping Yahweh and idol worship. The preceding chapter is about what will happen to Israel because they have gone after other gods and were not living according to the word of Yahweh. It has nothing to do with non-religious practices such as what jewelry they wear. None of these verses, when taken in context, support the idea that Yahweh's people cannot wear jewelry or makeup. For more on what exactly is pagan, please see our teachings titled, What is Pagan? and The Lost Sheep. Number 2. Moses made the Israelites drink the water with gold dust in it. Two verses cited to prove that Yahweh is against jewelry are found in Exodus 32 and 33. In those passages, Moses ground the golden calf into dust and made the Israelites drink it. He also made them remove their jewelry. For some, this proves that wearing jewelry is bad. So let's look at those passages. Exodus 32:20. He took the calf that they made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Exodus 33, 5. For Yahweh had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. As with all testing, we need to first determine the context of these passages. In Exodus 32 and 33, we find ourselves at the golden calf incident and immediately after it. These events occur not too long after Israel has left Egypt and Moses has gone up the mountain to speak with Yahweh. Remember, the Israelites had plundered the Egyptians when they left, so they had a lot of gold and jewelry, etc. The wealth they took from Egypt was a blessing, but they used some of that blessing to create the golden calf after Moses had been up on the mountain for 40 days. 
When Moses comes down, he's understandably upset with them, not because they were wearing jewelry, but because they had disobeyed Yahweh. They'd made an idol and were using it as a way to worship him. This is why Moses melted down the calf and ground the gold to dust, which is what he then made them drink. This, along with Yahweh telling them to remove the jewelry, was a punishment for their actions. They were commanded to remove their jewelry as a temporary punishment, as a sign that they had misused their blessings. This was not a permanent injunction against wearing jewelry. The context tells us that the prohibition was not permanent, and we can also see from the rest of the scriptures that jewelry is not a bad thing at all. We will cover the places that scripture speaks positively of jewelry later on. Number three, jewelry and wearing makeup is vanity. It only serves the sinful flesh. Jeremiah 4.30 is one verse used to defend the position against wearing jewelry and makeup. Jeremiah 4.30 And you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourselves. Your lovers despise you, they seek your life. As you can see from these verses, there is something to the idea that wearing jewelry or makeup can feed our flesh, especially our vanity. However, there is a difference between wearing jewelry or makeup to feel pretty and being vain, desiring to flaunt your wealth or beauty. What is vanity? According to the Random House Dictionary, vanity can be defined as excessive pride in one's appearance, qualities, abilities, achievements, etc. Character or quality of being vain, conceit. Vanity for the sake of vanity shows a heart, a desire, that is not following Yahweh. It is about pleasing your flesh and being beautiful for the sake of beauty. With vanity comes pride and arrogance. These are born out of self-love, not the love of the Creator. A bride makes herself beautiful to shine on the day she weds. She makes herself beautiful for herself and for her groom. This is different than one who lives to serve themselves and is haughty because of their beauty. Even Yahweh gave jewelry to be worn. Look at this. Exodus 3, 21 and 22. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor, and any woman who lives in her house, for silver and gold jewelry, and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Ezekiel 16, 10 through 12. And I clothed you with beautiful finished cloth, and I put sandals on you of fine leather, and I bound you in fine linen, and I covered you with costly fabric. And I adorned you with ornaments, and I put a bracelet on your arms and a necklace on your neck. And I put an ornamental ring on your nose and earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Read about the extravagant adornment Yahweh required on the high priest in Exodus 28. It's full of fine linen, gold, and gemstones. There is nothing wrong with someone wearing beautiful clothing or jewelry. Having beauty or making yourself look nice, even if using makeup or jewelry, is not a sin. It is the heart and desire behind it that dictates whether or not something is sinful. Look at Queen Esther. Was she showing excessive pride in her appearance when she dressed nicely and wore makeup to meet the king? Not likely. In Jeremiah, the context of the whole of chapter 4 is about Israel needing to turn from their ways lest they be destroyed. Judgment was coming upon Israel. It would be laid to waste. It would become desolate. No amount of beautifying would make the land and people more desirable. This is the context of Jeremiah 4.30. It is not about wearing a ring, a necklace, or makeup. It's about when you try to make yourself look good on the outside, but remain filthy on the inside, something our Messiah echoed. Matthew 23, 25-28 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and of everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you also appear righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This brings us to the next statement in verse. Number four, jewelry and makeup is only for prostitutes and others seeking the wrong kind of attention. 
It's true that prostitutes seek the wrong kind of attention and wear both makeup and jewelry to help them get it. However, does that mean that anyone who wears makeup or jewelry is a prostitute or seeking the wrong type of attention? Of course not. Let's look at the verse often referenced for this, Ezekiel 23:40. They even sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent, and behold, they came. For them you bathed yourself, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. The context of this verse in Ezekiel is in the midst of Yahweh speaking about how Israel had been playing the harlot. They had turned from their God and turned to the nations instead. During this period, Yahweh does speak about how he will take away their jewels and tear their clothing. In essence, he is taking away their beauty because they have defiled themselves. He is not condemning the wearing of jewelry or makeup. He is not condemning their beauty. He is removing some of what helps to make them beautiful to the world. What about the prostitute or harlot aspect of things here? We agree that while playing the harlot, they dressed up. But they are not the only ones who get dressed up. Look at Queen Esther, who was adorned with makeup and royal robes to be pleasing. Esther 2.9 And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Did that make Esther a harlot? A prostitute? Of course not, because context matters. Esther was dressed up in order to be attractive to the king, in the hopes of being found pleasing. Esther was given makeup to wear, but we see no mention of this being a sin. We never see any place where she is condemned for this behavior, not even by Mordecai. Why? Because wearing makeup is not against the Torah. Was she trying to get the wrong type of attention? Not at all. She was applying to be the wife of the king. In scripture, being a prostitute or a harlot is not just about what someone wears. It has more to do with their behaviors than their appearance. If we apply the same logic regarding the clothing to other things related to the harlot, then it's likely we will all have some changes to make. Proverbs 7 speaks of a harlot who is also an adulteress. Verse 10 shows us she's dressed like a prostitute. Verses 16 through 17 show us other things she has done. Yet we do not see any condemnation of her dress, wearing makeup, or jewelry. Proverbs 7.10 And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Proverbs 7.16 and 17 I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. If the verses from Ezekiel imply that we shouldn't wear makeup or jewelry, then wouldn't these verses from Proverbs imply that we shouldn't use perfumes or have linens on our beds? Clearly, these passages do not imply these things. The point of these scriptures is that we should not engage in physical or spiritual prostitution. Proverbs 5 speaks of another harlot. Know what we are being warned to look for. Proverbs 5, verses 3-6 through 6. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. We are warned about her words, her actions, and her thoughts. Did you notice what was absent? A warning against her wearing jewelry and makeup. This is the pattern in Scripture whenever harlots or prostitutes are mentioned. We are to beware of them because of their actions and where following them will lead us. We are never warned against wearing makeup or jewelry because harlots wear it. Later in the teaching, we will cover additional passages where jewelry is worn by others that are not harlots to further illustrate the futility of that argument. A final thought on this topic. If a five-year-old girl is playing dress-up or wants to wear makeup to look pretty, does that mean she has the wrong intentions there? Is she seeking the wrong kind of attention? If a grown woman puts on some base and eyeliner, does that mean she's seeking the wrong attention? If a wife puts on makeup so that she feels pretty or to look pretty for her husband, does that automatically mean she's doing so only for the wrong kind of attention? Hopefully you answered no to all of those questions. If nothing else, just based upon what we have covered prior to this point in the teaching. Wearing jewelry or makeup does not mean a woman is looking for inappropriate attention. Context matters. This leads us to the last argument we'll cover that is used against wearing jewelry. Number five. Our beauty should come from the inside, not from what we put on. 
We do agree that beauty should be something that is an internal thing. However, it does not have to be an either-or choice between internal and external beauty. To support the statement that beauty should only come from the inside, Paul and Peter are often quoted. 1 Timothy 2, 9-10 Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. In 1 Peter 3, 3-5 Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. Both of these statements indicate that a woman's beauty should not be based upon what adorns her. We feel that everyone's adornment, whether male or female, should be modest and not flashy. What these verses are saying is that the only adornment a woman should be concerned about is what's to be in her heart and spirit, in her actions and attitudes, not what she's wearing. This is true of everyone. The Father looks at our hearts and judges our hearts. It's a man that looks at the person's outward appearance. It doesn't mean, however, that Paul, Peter, or Yahweh are forbidding the wearing of jewelry and makeup. The focus of the person should not be on the jewelry or appearing beautiful. The focus should remain on being a person who is following the word. Physical beauty is temporary as all bodies deteriorate over time and eventually die. But living a life according to the Torah, full of love for Yahweh and people, is the greater beauty that does not fade. That is the beauty that should be striven for more than any external beauty. When we look for the context of these passages, instead of just picking out a couple of verses that suit our need, we find a larger pattern. Paul and Peter are both addressing how we should be living our lives before Yahweh and the world. The focus is on the behavior of Yahweh's people in interpersonal relationships, not outward appearance. We are to care more about how we interact with one another than how we look, how we are to live in this world as members of the body. It doesn't matter if a person could be the most outwardly beautiful person who ever lived. If their conduct is not respectful and pure, then they are not truly beautiful. If their heart is not gentle and their spirit is not quiet, then they're not living as they should be. Again, the focus and purpose of these passages and preceding ones are focused on behaviors, not appearances. Just as Paul indicated, we need to care more about having a heart for Yahweh and less about our outward appearance. This is really the same discussion we had near the beginning of the teaching relating to the subject of vanity. Jewelry and or makeup can be positive. So far, we've addressed the most popular scriptures that are used to claim that jewelry and makeup are forbidden. Hopefully, you can see that, in context, these verses are not prohibiting jewelry or makeup at all. Now we'd like to touch briefly on verses in scripture where the giving, receiving, or wearing of jewelry and makeup, or nice clothes, can be viewed in a positive light. Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself, like a priest with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Here we see that both a bridegroom and a bride are dressed up. The bride is even adorned with jewels. In fact, it says that Yahweh clothed Isaiah with the garments of salvation and a robe of righteousness that are likened to the beauty of those getting married. The garments and robe must be beautiful and wonderful indeed. Ezekiel 16, 11 through 13. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Once again, we see Yahweh adorning with ornaments, bracelets, a necklace, a nose ring, earrings, and a crown. Then, in addition to those, he gave them wonderfully rich clothing. While this is metaphorical, it is only to a point when we consider what Solomon was given when he followed Yahweh, great wealth and extravagance. Just listen to some of what Solomon was given by Yahweh. 2 Chronicles 1, 14 and 15 Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities, 
and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. 2 Chronicles 9, 13 through 21. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold, besides that which the explorers and merchants brought. And all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went into each shield. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold, which were attached to the throne. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests, while twelve lions stood there, one on each end of a step on the six steps. Nothing like it was ever made for any kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. 1 Kings 10, 4, and 5 And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. Solomon had such riches and so many fine things. Gold and silver were as common as stone. There was probably a lot of fine jewelry as well, even if it wasn't specifically stated. Remember the argument that Peter said women shouldn't wear fine clothing? Well, even Solomon's servants had it, so much so that it took the Queen of Sheba's breath away. Look at the coverings of one of Yahweh's creations, a cherub. He was covered in precious jewels and gold. Yahweh adorned him this way as a good thing, not a bad thing. Ezekiel 28, 13-17 You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, and beryl, and onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. Or consider what was done for the prodigal son in the parable, Luke 15:22. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The best robe and a ring on his finger. Signs of wealth and favor being given to the prodigal son who has returned home. These are favorable things, not sinful ones. Genesis 24:53, And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. Here we see Abraham's servant giving jewelry and beautiful garments to Rebekah as a sign of favor, a gift. These items were not given to Rebekah because she was a prostitute or an immoral person. On the contrary, they were given to Rebekah because she had outstanding moral character and was a fitting wife for Isaac. And finally, Proverbs 25:12. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Here, wisdom is being likened to a golden ring. This is a good thing, not something sinful. Why would Yahweh use something that is sinful as a metaphor for something that is good? The simple answer is, he wouldn't. Conclusion in conclusion, the idea that we should not wear jewelry or makeup is nothing more than man's misguided understanding of Scripture. We have reviewed the five primary reasons why many believe jewelry and makeup are to be avoided. In reviewing those reasons and their supporting Scriptures, we found that many times it is a misapplication of Scripture because the context was not taken into account. We were unable to find anywhere in the Torah that the wearing of jewelry and makeup is forbidden by the Creator and made a sin forever. Instead, what we find are a couple of select instances where Israel was being punished for disobeying Yahweh. We also saw numerous examples where jewelry and fine clothes were considered a blessing from Yahweh, or were used to indicate the favor bestowed upon individuals. We even saw how metaphorically, and in Solomon's case literally, Yahweh bestowed such gifts upon his people when they were obedient to him. 
Even Yahweh's high priest was richly attired with gold and jewels. To say that Yahweh is against jewelry is not only silly, but just plain wrong. The wearing of jewelry or makeup is not something forbidden by the Torah, nor is it something that only pagans and prostitutes wear. There is nothing wrong with adorning oneself with such things to enhance beauty. The problem arises when it becomes your focus and intent, or vanity. When we keep our eyes on the outer physical beauty, we see only what is fading and worthless in the end. Remember, there is no Torah commandment from Yahweh forbidding jewelry or makeup. If we claim that Yahweh forbids such things, then we're adding to the Torah. It is true that jewelry and makeup can be worn because of vanity, when a person values their physical appearance more than they value the things of God, but they can also be worn in order to please one's husband, just like Yahweh clothes Israel with beautiful garments and stones. Jewelry and makeup can be used for evil purposes or for good ones. They are not inherently evil, and they are not forbidden by the scriptures. We must strive to keep our eyes focused on the Creator and His ways. By doing so, we will become beautiful people with hearts seeking after Yahweh. A heart after Yahweh is where true beauty is found. A heart after Yahweh will be full of love for Him and for people. Nothing is quite as beautiful as a person who exudes love and genuine concern for those around them. A beautiful person on the outside may soon fade away into ugliness if they are not properly attired with a beautiful heart and spirit. We hope that this teaching has blessed you, and remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.